May the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, our Lord. I'd like to talk to you this morning about obsession. I wonder how many of us here have been swept up in the moment and allowed it to take over our lives. Back in 1960, four ordinary men formed a band in Liverpool. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Ringo Starr were the four, the band being the Beatles, perhaps one of the most influential bands in the 20th century. By 1963, something amazing had happened with the Beatles. Beatlemania, the intense fans' frenzy, directed towards the British rock band during the early years of their success began in 1963 and continued past their band's breakup in 1970. Mostly female, the Beatles fans would follow the band from venue to venue, purchasing merchandise and living their lives the focus upon the band. Indeed, this popularity may be seen as one of the reasons why the band broke up. George Harrison quoted as saying, The more fame we got, the more girls came to see us, everybody making a noise so that nobody could hear us. Constant touring, the constant attention on the band members, when performing or not, and the challenge to find and schedule bigger and bigger venues triggered the band to stop touring in 1966. After the Beatles, the term mania was used to describe the popularity of later acts, as well as the popularity of public figures and trends outside of music as well. But as we approach Palm Sunday and reflect back on that triumphant entry into Jerusalem of Jesus Christ, it's clear that mania isn't anything new. Jesus was not well respected by the Jewish and Roman leaders of his time. As with the Beatles in the 60s, I can imagine parents discouraging their children against following that bad influence Jesus, as no good will come from his wild words. After all, Jesus had been teaching God's word, but not in a way that included or extolled the virtues of the current day, a threat to the establishment at that time. However, just as the Beatles proved their skill at producing catchy tunes which proved their worth to their fans, Jesus had proved his divinity and truth numerous times as well. Miracles of healing, logical arguments to sway even the hardest heart, and his understanding for one of humble roots had convinced many as to who Jesus was. Jesus' mania had been born, and at the end of his ministry, Jesus met those Jesus' mania fans as he entered Jerusalem. Now, I enjoy the Beatles' music. I enjoy quite a lot of music, actually, but I've never really been a fan of any one band or artist to the extent that it consumes my life. I suspect that those who do hold a picture in their mind of what the band or artist should be. They'll put an unrealistic, better-than-the-best expectation upon them, seeing them as personal only to the fan. In Japan, over the past 20 years, manufactured idol bands have become popular, with their fans being loyal to an image of the band members that is marketed as cleverly as the music they perform. In Japan, however, it's to the extent whereby the members of those idol bands have their lives and their private lives closely managed, not being allowed romantic relationships, for example, because... The marketing machine tells the fans that those attractive idols just might become the next boy or girlfriend of the loyal fan. Roll back the clock to the events of Palm Sunday. And although there was no marketing machine behind Jesus, it's fair to say that those welcoming him into the city had expectations and preconceptions as to who Jesus was. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the crowd treated him like a king. What did they expect him to do next? Remembering their scripture, they probably expected him to assume some governance in place of the Jewish and Roman leaders of the time. Now, at that time, the Jewish people made up roughly 8% of the Roman Empire. Of the 50 million inhabitants of the Roman Empire, 4 million were Jews and 700,000 of them lived in Israel. Your average family lived in a one-room two-level dwelling with living quarters separated from and raised above the animal stalls. Jewish extended families often lived together as well, despite those small accommodations. Contrast that with wealthy Romans who had large homes and enjoyed four meals a day of meat and dairy, while many of the ordinary Jews perhaps had two meals a day consisting mostly of bread. Due to the Jewish triple tax, which was 10% to the priests and Levites, 10% for temple uh, sacrifice, and a bit over 3% for the poor. Putting on top of that the normal Roman taxes, 
Jews could pay more than half their income in tax. The Jews held as much distrust and often hatred of the Roman Empire. They were unwilling subjects. At the time of Jesus' birth, the local Roman ruler, King Herod, had initiated a massacre of all Jewish baby boys born at the time. Herod was also responsible for placing forbidden idols within the Jewish temple. Such actions added more reasons for Jewish resentment of the foreign Roman government. Over the days following his arrival into Jerusalem, undoubtedly many people were disappointed when Jesus didn't fulfill their expectations. The people were caught up in the idea of Jesus as king, boxing him into a pigeonhole of their own ideas as to what the fulfillment of scripture should look like. After all, these were harsh times for the Jewish people. They were a people in an occupied land, looking for freedom promised them centuries before. Human nature can be a fickle thing. When your hero fails to live up to the standards defined by people wanting freedom, is it a surprise that within the space of only a few short days, these people gripped by Jesus' mania would instead be shouting, crucify him from the crowd? There can be, I think, a fine line between liking something or someone and taking it too far, following the spin and hype instead. The problem with the latter is that there are gaps to fill, meaning the person enthralled by mania fills in those gaps. They put themselves personally and centrally in who and what they follow, which can only lead to disappointment when inevitably the truth is in contrast to what they had imagined in those gaps. The Jewish people wanted salvation. Jesus had come to bring this, but the Jewish people wanted an immediate salvation from Roman rule. The Jewish people wanted a king. Jesus had come at just that, but not a king with armies to command, rather as a king who is servant to the needs of his people. The Jewish people were disappointed as Jesus had not met their expectations. The emotional highs became lows and their cries of Hosanna became cries of crucify. So what can we learn from this for ourselves? Certainly there is a lot to be said for the bigger picture. We may be disappointed by the actions or behaviour of others in the short term, but if we don't know the overall plan, how can we know that the short term low doesn't lead to a long term high? Of course, we live in a world of distraction, suffering and hardship. Many might rail at God asking why, how can you allow this? But none of us know the detail of God's plan. However, we do know that countless times before, he has come through for those who follow him. And that's certainly good enough for me. Amen.